Hello, everyone. Welcome to the C Squared podcast. Today, we actually have a couple of awesome guests with us. We've got our new cohort, Holly Royal, who's joining us for the first time. Well, the second time <laughs> on the podcast, but the first time as a co-host. Um, we had her as a guest previously, and now she's helping us out. And we also have the absolutely legendary, she told me not to call her that, but I'm doing it anyway, Sarah Jezebel Deva, Diva. Bleh. See, I knew I was going to screw that up. Um, Sarah Jezebel Diva, she has been in the metal music world forever. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely lots of good info in this show. And we are going to have a blast because she is a blast. So first, I want to say welcome to Holly and thank you to Sarah for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me back again. <laughs> yeah. And so, Sarah, for people who have been living under a rock for like the past 30 years or however long you've been in metal, um, do you want to give just like a nutshell version of who you are, what you do, and a little bit about your history, just the, the, the brief version? What I'd like to say, firstly, it's not been 30 years because then you would have aged me, right? And I'd be close to claiming my pension. Right. <laughs> um, you I've been, could have been singing. in the metal world since you were 12 or <laughs> no, no, a bit older than that. A bit older than that. Uh 16. Mm -hmm. Wait, yes, so it was 30 years then almost because because that, that's almost 30 years, isn't it? I hope not, because I'm 44. Yeah, that's, that's almost 30, 30 years. That's years. that's 28 yeah. years. I was yeah. close. Yeah. Wow, you are close. Wow, don't I feel really old now? No, wow. you're not old. You're distinguished. Yeah, you're yeah. distinguished. So, yeah, so, right. So um, I got into heavy metal when I was in school, probably about 15. Um, and I always wanted to sing, always. I knew I always wanted to sing from like a, a very young child. I had this passion for singing. Um, so just absolute long story really 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 long story short <laughs> um I had done a demo with my friend Barbarella she was like one of those really freaky goth girls she was awesome mad mad cat lady she was and um she helped me do my first demo which is highly embarrassing and I think it's lost now which is really really good um because it is really embarrassing. Like there's some bad narration on there along the lines of come back to me. I wish you didn't leave me. Oh, I mean, really, if that ever surfaces. <laughs> but anyway, so I did this demo, but that demo actually is what kind of helped me uh, have something solid to show to people. Um, I did an audition um, and I'm 100% on this because it took I, I forgot about this for many years but I did an audition for um a band um well it was a side project actually of a band and I believe they were called Zodiac Mind Walk um and but as I said that wasn't the band but it was two people from that band or one of them from that band and they were doing auditions and I went to St Albans um just outside well outside London and um didn't get it, but I was only like 16 at the time. I mean, I couldn't even drive. You, you can't drive until you're 18 anyway. So I did that audition. Um, I did a few other bits where when I was a little bit younger, I went into a recording studio. I was maybe 13 or 14. Um, so I already had these little things behind me. But um, I was talking to a friend. Um, oh, actually, go, go back just a little bit. Um, we used to follow this band around um, London called Who Moved the Ground? And um, they're kind of like, oh, I can't really compare them because I'll get into trouble if they ever heard this. But they were kind of like levelers type thing and kind of really liked them. And I met a guy who was associated with that band and he was in a punk band called Mad Dog. So that I suppose really is where it all started. I did an album called Howling at the Moon which, yeah, it sounds a bit, you know, weird. Yep. But um, there was no howling, just to let you know. I did a gig with him. It was full-on punk, supporting a band called 999, who are legendary in the UK and in the punk punk scene. Um, 
I did one show. They were all the punks in the audience were spitting at the stage. And bear in mind, I was, you know, barely 16. I didn't like it. I hated it. But the good thing is that I had some of these demos behind me and a little bit of audition experience and this and that. Said to my friend Adele, who I used to go to school with, do you know anybody that's looking for a singer? And she was like, yeah, there's this band called Cradle of Filth. Um, now, prior to this audition, I was working in a video shop. I know I keep going back and forth, but it all does eventually oh. make sense. Oh. <clears throat> um, I was working in a video shop. My boyfriend had just dumped me. That boyfriend, funny enough, is now my husband. Uh, so it's a long time we've got me and him have got a long history um but yeah he, we we finished for the first time um I was working in this video shop and a pen pal of mine from Wales um sent me a tape a cassette tape and it was the principle of evil made flesh and I put that tape on uh I had didn't know of, of Cradle of Filth prior to this uh, I put the tape on I listened to a very small amount. I heard, and this is no offense to Danny at all. I heard Danny sing and I took the tape out and I literally said, what a pile of shit. Can I swear? Sorry, I just swore. Bleep it out. I said, what a pile of shit. And I threw it in the bin, believe me. And that is the truth. I, I so remember it. And anyway, right. so then after that, I obviously was speaking to my friend Adele and I said, uh, do you know anyone that's looking for a singer? And it turned out that Cradle of Filth were. And uh, my brain sort of worked it all out. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the band that I think is a pile of crap. Well, it wasn't so much the band, I didn't like the singer. Um, and so I hooked up with them in a flat or apartment, as you call it, uh, in Manor Park in London. And it was me and Adele, um, her boyfriend, their photographer, um and Paul and Danny and they'd heard a little bit of this embarrassing demo um and I just I don't know they must have heard me singing but I was singing along to uh Sisters of Mercy Temple of Love uh mm. the one with Ofra Haza in it and I got hired as the backing singer and so that is, is how everything started for me you know bit of work here you know a bit of experience there a failed audition there a punk band there where you get spat at and then you know it led to Cradle of Filth and that was the very start for me so I've actually forgotten your first question but hopefully <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah that is amazing but that pretty but, much was my the, my first question was just how you got started and and where you're yeah. coming from and everything so when hey. when I got with Cradle of Filth I still couldn't drive so any anything that had to be done I mean I didn't do my first show with on the metal scene until 1997 so there was a few years in between recording and you know being with them so yeah that's awesome all your first Yes, I know. I'm trying to, oh, I've got so many questions now. It's like, which one do I go for? Um, oh. I kind any. of. Oh, okay. Ask me anything. <laughs> I'm kind no, of. I'm sorry, I hope this isn't going off on too much of a tangent. Um, I'm kind of interested to know how you found it. Obviously, I don't know, sort of being a, a young woman, really, um, in the early stages, because obviously I know you're sort of. <coughs> Um, I don't know how to phrase this. Um, no, I know what happened. You sort of. So you want me to tell you how it was in the very early stages, being female in a male-dominated scene, maybe? Yeah, that's sort of what I mean. if, if, <laughs> Yeah, basically. I'm kidding. I mean, I I'm can... <laughs> Is that what you want to ask? Yeah, I can avoid that question if it's going to open up a can of worms. No, 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 absolutely not. No, um, not, not at all, it's fine. Because um, it's quite easy to answer, really. Really yeah. scary, you know, really scary. Um, I That I know of, and obviously there's going to be some veterans out there that go, no, you weren't the only one, but there wasn't many. Is it Sarkana? Mm. 
if that's how you say her name from Gehenna, uh, Norwegian band Gehenna. Um, yeah. Her is it Karen Crisis? I think yeah. she round. Uh, um, I can't remember the lady's name from Bolt Thrower. Then you've uh, got who else can I think of? The Amanda yeah. Gauss. Um, probably that's all I can think of off the top of my head. The scene hardly had any women in it. Obviously, you've got, you know, Vixen and you've got Joan Jett. You're going more towards the rockier side. But if you want to go to the extreme side, like death metal, black metal, yeah, I didn't know of anybody. Uh, and I was very new. You bear in mind, again, I started when I was 16. And the first time I hooked up with Cradle of Filth in Colchester, after I had got this position, we were, I can't, we were at their rehearsal room. Um, I think the rehearsal room, it was a rehearsal space. And I know it was definitely Colchester, but obviously it's so long ago and everybody was there. Um, John from Hakate Enthroned, I believe he was there with his girlfriend. Um, Cause I think Rob had left as bass player then and John took mm -hmm. over. And as I said, John was the lead singer of the cartoon throne. Um, Nick was there, everyone was there. And I remember the one, one of the first things that was said to me wasn't, it, there was no politeness, no niceness, no nothing. It was hi, how, you know, it wasn't hi, how are you? Oh, you're nervous. Oh, let's have a sandwich together and a cuddle. Nothing like that. The first thing that was said to me was by Nick Barker and he went, you never know, might make enough money to get your bus fare home. <laughs> you know, wasn't, hopefully you understood that. I can say that without the accent. But mm. yeah, it was very intimidating, you know, to have someone that you didn't know to say, you know, you never know, you might make enough money to make your, your, your bus fare home. It's like kind of like, oh, okay, well, I'm on my own. How do I take that? And it was their sense of humour. And their mm. sense of humour was pretty brutal. So as again, as I say, for a young girl that was not experienced in any way, um, it was very scary and it got worse and worse and worse. So, you know, the recording studio experience was okay. Um, we did Dusk in her Embrace first and that was when people, um, I, I'm just trying to remember everything. Um, I've, I did my vocals. I think when I met the band, that must, John was there. So maybe Rob hadn't left the band. But anyway, um, just trying to get my timeline and it's very difficult. Um, but we did Dusk and Embrace for the first time and that was up north. Um, and the band lost three members um, who walked out. Paul Allender, Paul Ryan and Ben Ryan. They left. And that version of Dusk and Embrace never got released. Mm. And um, I wasn't with most of them. I, you know, it was just, um, I was only with Dan and probably Ben through that recording. Um, and then, as I say, split up, the whole, the recording got held up. Then we did Vampire. Um, and again, that experience was, you know, okay, it wasn't too bad. But some, or say one person that was in the band was pretty, yeah, mm -hmm. not nice, pretty rude, pretty <clears throat> and pretty sexist. Um, and that's where it all started. But I for, I'd forgotten about all of that. And it wasn't until I did my first tour in 1997, and it was the Dusk and Embrace tour, uh, sorry, Rape and Ruin of Europe. Um, that yeah, I was on a tour bus, what, for six weeks, the only woman, and it was horrible. I'll be honest with you, um, not many people had my back, probably Dan did, Rob did, um, but it was very hostile, very intimidating and horrible. In fact, at one point, the manager said to me, do you want me to take you home? She was out, I think she was out in Italy or something like that. And she said, do you want me to take you home? And I said, no, I can do it. I can get through this tour. 
And I'm and the thing is, if I'd have gone home, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. Well, wherever I am today, or I wouldn't have done everything that I did if I had gone home. That would have been my career knocked on the head. But because I was so influenced by Madonna, and people can laugh at this, she's had such a bad time working her way up that she's right you know you let people knock you down and you stand back up again and you and you prove them wrong and you take no crap and I didn't go home and I completed the tour and it was horrible really horrible but I then continued to work so what I'm trying to say is if I didn't allow myself to be treated like utter crap I wouldn't have done other albums and I wouldn't have done what I'd done to this day. Um, and that's a really sad thing to say that you have to allow yourself to be treated like crap, like something that you just stepped in to get where you want to be. And that is literally how it is. And the thing is, I know I've got to be careful with what I say um, because people don't like the truth. And when mm. you start speaking the truth, it gets people's backs <laughs> up and they're like, oh, she's yeah. a gobby this and she's mouthy this and she's that. The simple fact is you don't like the truth and you don't like it when it comes back and bites you in the butt because people know how they treated me and they know how they treated other people. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't easy and it wasn't fun. Um, but as my touring period went on, I learned to bite back um, and, you know, I learned to really sort of walk in a room. And when I walked in a room, a lot of people said it to me, when you walk in a room, we know you're there. And I don't know if it's because, you know, I'm, I, I'm a joker. I like to muck about, but I'm also really happy as well. But a lot of people would say you were like the light that walked into the room. So nice. it was nice to hear. It was nice to hear, but it took a lot for me to get to that point I'm telling you it really really did and it was very difficult at times very difficult you know so hopefully that answers your question it does thank you so before I ask my next question did Corey did, did you have a follow-up to that before no actually I think it's a good segue into the next question so I won't I won't interrupt that Okay, that's good. So, um, base, so basically, the next part of the question is, um, so, I, well, we kind of went into it, but how did you kind of get those other gigs and opportunities that I mean, I, you said, like, you know, you, you took the crap, you continued, but you've done a lot of stuff outside of Cradle of Health, right? So how did you also get those other types of gigs? Well, okay, so um, on that tour, on the um uh, Rape and Ruin of Europe, there was a six-day festival um, and it was us, Dimu Borgia, Dissection and In Flames. Wow. Uh, and on one of the first of those six shows, Nagash from The Covenant came up to me and he said, are you the one that sung on Duskiner Embrace and Vampire? And I went, yeah. And he went, would you like to work with us, the Covenant? Well, they were called Covenant at the time. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I was, what was I doing? I was, I'd met some people on that first tour and I went to Sweden for the very first time. And I believe it was in 1997. <laughs> where I was staying at Heathen Doom Records um, within the Stockholm area. And I met up with, someone got me in contact with Christopher Ethereum, um, because believe it or not, just backtracking slightly, me and my friend Marcia, we were at a gig and we knew the, uh, the promoter, a guy called Mike from the Devil's Church in London. Yeah. And... Um, we were around his place, I believe it was after the Marduk gig or something like that. I, mean, I heard Telly or Thilly, Telly, however you want to pronounce it from Therion. Um, and I said to my mate Marcia, this album's amazing. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could sing for this band? Well, 
I don't know how I did it, but I ended up singing for Therion because, as I said, when I got to Sweden, a friend hooked me up with Christopher from Therion. He knew I wasn't a trained opera singer, and Christopher has a very strict way of working. Mm -hmm. All his singers are trained, um, or they were, um, and I was the only one who had no training whatsoever. And on that same trip, while staying at Heathen Doom Records, my friend also put me in contact with Mortis. So I had a phone call with Mortis while I was staying there. And we just got chatting because I wanted him, uh, it's just come back to me now, I wanted him to sign me if I could get a project going. But it turned out that I ended up working for him. So within that year, 1997, I was obviously touring. I got the job with Covenant, I got the job with Mortis, and I got the job with Therion. So that is where everything really, really started, I suppose. And because I'd had two albums behind me, two proper albums being Dusk and Embrace, because um, I had the first version that wasn't released, and obviously we released, we re-recorded and, and, and re-released, sorry, the second version of Dusk, which is the really popular one that everyone obviously knows about. Um, but yeah, because I had two hard copies of albums with me singing operatically and all of that, it was easy for me to get this work. Um, but I never planned on being just a backing singer. It was never, ever the, the road that I wanted to go down. And um, without mentioning any names, I had also been threatened that if I work with any other band, I would never work with a certain band again. And um, I bit the bullet and I remember phoning up Rob from Cradle, uh, the bass player, and I said, and he's like, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm in Germany. I, I said, I'm recording with Covenant. And he went, good. He said, do it. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. And uh, if I'd had listened to the threat again, I wouldn't have done Covenant and I probably wouldn't have done Therion and Amortis and anything else, you know. I, I think um, maybe because I was so young and so inexperienced and maybe people knew how much I wanted to sing, they used that as a bargaining chip, as an emotional blackmail thing. And I'm not saying everybody at all, you know. There, there's been some incidences where someone's been a complete a-hole and then a week later been very, very supportive, you know, and um, we were all young. Again, I put a lot of the things down to just being young, really. So, yep. Any follow-ups, Curtis? No, I was waiting for you because I thought you were going next. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, I no follow-ups on that one, but I do have one question. We've talked a lot about touring and how, I mean, you've done a lot of touring in your day. Um, and we all know that it's hard. It can all, it can really drain you, but do you have any like survival tips for younger bands who might be looking at their first tour or who are new to this that, you know, really helped you get through the more difficult tours that you were on? I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, you, you got to think that I stopped touring well over eight years ago now um and it is hard it's hard on you mentally it can be you see it depends if you're a guy and you just want to play music and get drunk okay and it's probably quite easy but it depends what you're doing for me when I was with Cradle and Therion, bear in mind, most of my vocals were really high. I couldn't live that life of the same life as everybody else. Mm. I mean, I did, don't get me wrong. Um, for example, the last two weeks of that first Cradle tour I did, I did drunk. You know, I was on stage drunk most of the time because it was the only way to get me through. Um, mm. Uh, that's just how I got through yeah there was other times like say the typo negative tour where you know amazing guys 
And every other night I would go up and stand next to Josh, the keyboard player, a typo, and he'd be drinking vanilla absolute vodka. And I'd be drinking that too, right before my show. So yeah, most of the times I went on, I was a bit, yeah, couldn't stand up very well. I could get the notes out though, so it was all right. But when you're surrounded by people who are drinking and smoking constantly, um, you know, especially on the bus, they don't care about you, that you've got to sing the next day. Uh, obviously, you can't smoke on a bus anymore, so that's fine. Uh, but back then, again, I can remember another tour when I was with Therion. It was all Swedish guys, and they were smoking to high heaven. And Chris went to me, you know, you need to go to bed early. You're a soprano. And I'm like, well, I didn't argue, but I'm like, well, how can I go to bed when you're blazing all this music? You're all smoking. And it's like a fog machine in my bunk, you know? Um, you, you just you just can't. So you get involved and then you get caught up in the drinking and this and that. So to kind of answer your question, well, there really isn't any survival tips. It depends what instrument you have, you know? As a singer, I mean, I, I've I've done so many shows where I can't hear myself and I can't pitch properly because I've not had a good sound check. And the night before, I've been kept up until six o'clock in the morning. I think having headphones gets you through the tour. You know, technology is different now as well. You've got to bear in mind that so many years ago, a mobile phone, when you were making phone calls overseas, you were paying something like $1.50 a minute. Or, you know, yep. a pound a minute. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. Um, we've got laptops that we are taken away on tours now, and so survival tips. <sighs> probably try not to believe everything you hear, and have as much personal space as you possibly can to get through. Otherwise, you'll go nuts. You'll go nuts. Me and Charles, I know I keep going back to people and forward and jumping. Me and Charles, um, who Charles was in Cradle of Filth for a few years, and as you probably well know, he's in mayhem now. Me and him were so close in the beginning, so close, to the point where people actually thought that we were, you know, at it. And we weren't, we were just close. We just got on well, we found common ground. By the end of my time in Cradle of Filth, me and Charles were barely talking. And that's how being forced onto a bus, well, was, well, I don't mean forced, but being forced to be in everyone's space affects friendships. You, That's why you do need your space on tour. You, you know, being with the same person every day, you've got to respect people's space and you've got to respect your own need for that space. Me and Charles didn't speak for about 10 years for wow. no reason other than we didn't, we didn't fall out, but we just lost that connection. <clears throat> now we're in touch again. And it's amazing because I adore him. I've always adored him because Charles will tell me exactly how it is. and He will be honest. Um, and yeah, we're back in touch, but we lost 10 years. And that's happened with other people as well. Uh, you can have brilliant relationships on tour. And by the end of it, well, you know, bands split for a reason, don't they? People walk away for a reason or they get fired for a reason. It's very difficult tour in life, but some people breeze through it. Some people live for it. They yearn for it, you know. Um, I don't know if I want to tour again. I will do some things, but because I've got a son now, the thought of being away from him, uh, yeah, it doesn't appeal to me at all. So yeah. hopefully that answers it. Uh, so Sarah, one thing we got to take 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 up because uh, we probably got about fifteen minutes. We've already been close to an hour, I think. Um, <laughs> so we we do need to take up uh, your new project, Torn Between Two Worlds. Um, you want? Can you briefly just kind of go over that uh, quickly? What it is and uh, how it came about, and the new song. Okay. So Torn Between Two Worlds is a project with me and Chris Wren. Uh, I met Chris 
on tour. I was with Therion. He was playing for Evergrey. I don't know if he actually did a recording with Evergrey. So that's something maybe you guys can check out. But um, yeah, so we met on tour. I wanted to, as I told you, I never planned on being just a backing singer. And that's how it's been for most of my career, really, being a backing singer. Um, I wanted to do a project. I wanted to do my own band. And me and Chris got talking. And I went to Sundsvall in Sweden. Me and Chris did a five-track demo. Chris wrote the entire demo. I wrote my vocals. Um, the uh, five-track demo we handed out to a lot of people. Um, I was on Ozfest. We did Ozfest for 10 weeks, Cradle of Filth. I gave the demos out to a lot of people. Um, it got a really amazing response. Um, it got picked up by um, somebody. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce his name right. And if he ever hears me, he'll kill me. Ashmaday of uh, Melakesh. Um, he was working for, I don't know if it was like a PR company or same kind of thing as you guys, I don't know. Um, but he managed to get us a deal with Listenable Records. Um, so Antoria was formed. Um, Chris wrote probably 99% of God Has a Plan for Us All. Obviously didn't write, well, he rewrote Confide in Me, the Kylie Minogue cover. So we've got a two album deal with Listenable. Um, yeah, Chris had written nearly all the album. He got his brother Tommy in at the last point. Um, Chris, obviously Tommy did some stuff. He's, you know, amazing writer as well. Um, we did the album, got released. We did a video and that was it. Um, because as I've told other people in interviews, I was balancing Cradle of Filth, Mortis and Therion and Antoria was my dream. It was, the response we got was just mind blowing, the reviews and, you know, obviously there's going to be people out there that hated us. So there were probably, I think one review, she hated the album. She was expecting a Cradle of Filth follow-up and she didn't get it. And actually she was told to take the review down and someone else re-reviewed it because they felt, uh, they thought it was unfair. We probably got a few bad reviews, but other than that, we did so well. But I decided to favour Cradle of Filth. I walked away from Mortis. I walked away from, not badly, walked away from Therion and I held Antoria back and life got in the way Chris had a child Tommy had a child um you know we had to just work out our priorities me and Chris stayed in touch the whole time there was a few times we maybe we didn't talk for a year or something like that we always planned on doing a second Antoria album but it just didn't happen and then a few years well a bit more than a few years down the line few complications popped up and Chris and I still planned on writing music but it wasn't going to be under the Antoria name and I can't really go into that um, but it was going to be if we're going to do music it's still going to be our style it's still going to be how you're here in Antoria but it's not going to be under the Antoria name so yeah um, about six years ago, me and Chris finally got our act together. Chris wrote a few songs, The Beauty of Deception and All Eyes on Me. They got lost because life got in the way. My mate Dan Abella, he did the vote, uh, he recorded my vocals. Dan changed his studio about, as I said, things got lost. Um, they got forgotten about, but I kept saying to Chris, look, we need to do something. COVID-19 happened. Mm -hmm. We couldn't find the beauty of deception. But then, as I think I've told so many people, COVID-19 happened and I thought, right, I want to do music. I kind of had my, if you want to call it my mojo back, yeah. um, because obviously someone came into my life, a little lovely darling called Lindsay Schoolcraft. Mm -hmm. She woke me up. 
I was talking to people like Charles and uh, my friend Matthias, he used to play in hypocrisy. Um, and they were all like, yes, you should do it. You need to do it, blah, blah, blah. I learned Logic Pro X um, or still learning, got my equipment. Mortis then asked me to come back and help him out with some music. Oh, sorry, my cat just meowed. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, your, it's not your interview. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not your interview. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah, so suddenly people started wanting me. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I wanted to be wanted, but it was nice that people wanted me. Does that make sense? So yeah. anyway, so whilst learning Logic Pro X, I was having a, a, a lesson with Chris. We were doing it over Skype. And he said to me, get your headphones on i've got something to show you um i want you to turn it up as loud as possible and i want you to tell me what you think and i played the track and he had actually found this song uh, the beauty of deception and he'd found all my vocals that i'd done for that song and he'd mixed it he'd mixed it mastered it and sorted everything and i just cried i was so happy because it symbolized so much for me. Like our working relationship was suddenly back on track and we were doing something together because there's two people in my life that I've worked with, Dana Bella, um, who was part of my solo project, you know, Sarah Jezebel Diva, The Corruption of Mercy and Melediction, and Chris Wren. They're the two people that I would work with till my dying days because they are amazing. Anyway, so, we released that song. We decided to call it Torn Between Two Worlds because that was one of the track names on the five track demo that me and Chris did back in 2002. So it would lead, this new music would lead us through the Angtoria story back to the very beginning because this music does sound like Angtoria. It just sounds a bit fresher. I think a more mature and I call it I personally call it a direct continuation from God has a plan for us all so yeah we went with the name torn between two worlds Uh, we released that song and it got an amazing response and then the lost track all eyes on me Chris remembered it he rewrote the whole thing I found some vocals, well, Chris found some of my vocals, as in the lyrics that I'd written. I continued writing, and I did the vocals for that song in my home, in my front room. Um, And that's how that started. You know, Um, as I said, we'd always planned to work with each other again, always. Um, But it couldn't be under the name Antoria. Um, He didn't want it. And I understood why. Um, So at the end of the day, the writing hasn't changed. The way we do things hasn't changed. But you could see one day another album by Angtoria, but it won't be us. So this is me and Chris, how it started and how it will end. Cool. I've stopped now, by the way. (laughs) You what, Sarah? I've stopped talking now. When I stop talking, I should go beep so you know. (laughs) um i'm pretty sure holly's got a question though she's next yeah i'm sort of going on to pr stuff now really just wondering if you've ever had any sort of pr red flags with any of the bands that you've been involved with what do you mean um things new bands should watch out mm. for when they're working with industry pros like prs or managers shysters as i call them shysters like us and holly yeah Yeah. (laughs) actually yeah and that's one of the reasons why i quit doing music if i'm honest yeah one of the reasons so listenable records uh in france are one of the best companies that i have had the pleasure of knowing because lauren and his team they say it how it is they, well, Lauren especially, has supported me from the very beginning 
on my solo path. And although he couldn't continue with me and illegal downloads was a very big part of that, very big part of that, he is still there helping or giving me his point of view or just taking notice. Um, there have been very, very few people that I can say that about that have been honest and supportive. And in 2008, when I walked away from Cradle, because whether that relationship was coming to an end or not, I was going. Um, I was in a relationship and I thought there's more to life than, than what's going on and I want better and I want more. Um, and so I walked away um, and although that relationship went wrong it forced me into going solo and I was under the impression stupidly that because I'd done all these albums that maybe someone would give a damn and to be fair and brutally honest not many people did when you walk away from a band that is so big, um, and I don't think they're as big as what they were then, but when you walk away from a band that is so big, people want to know you. But if you don't have a tag behind you anymore, no one gives a crap. And that is brutally honest, and that's exactly how it is. But there was a few people that pretended to give a damn. and uh again got to be very very careful what i say mm -hmm. but the first album uh a sign of sublime i would rather listen to my cat farting in my ear for an hour than what is on that album or uh, that's me but there's humor in there but it's also it shouldn't have been how it was there are some tracks on there so for example um, I think one or two of the tracks was from that five track demo that me and Chris did in 2002. Chris let me have the tracks to help me with my solo album, which was amazing. A Sign of Sublime, the actual song came out good and the video came out amazing. Um, but the, the rest of the metal tracks came out awful and it's due to over editing. And when my mate Dana Bella got involved, he was brought in by the record company to, to mix the album. He stood with me outside his studio and he said, look, it's really bad. I can't mix this album. I can try, but because it's so over edited, there's nothing I can really do to make it sound better because all that power has been taken away from me. And it's very difficult to explain, I suppose, unless you're a musician, you'll understand what I mean by the over editing. But I suppose, let's say, you know, if you hit a drum and the drum, it resonates, it, it, it sort of the sound goes on for sort of five, 10 seconds, like an echo, you know, the vibration, all of that on every single thing that was done was cut short. So the moment you'd hit the drum, for example, it would just sound like someone just drops something on the floor. There was just everything had been taken away. And for me, it was a massive smack in the face because if you had this background like I did, your first solo album should be amazing. It should, it should have make, made people wake up and go, oh, she's not just a backing singer, she's a front woman, but it didn't happen. We did a few tours under my name and oh my God, I just, uh, the first gig we showed up at, the, the guy that owned the place, he said, well, yeah, your contract's on my table, but I've not signed it. So you can play if you want, but you're not getting paid. You know, all that kind of stuff. T-shirts on one of the other tours we did, uh, The Corruption of Mercy. Um, nothing to do with the record company. It was to do with the booking agent that we had and a merch guy that we'd been put in contact with. Um, basically the, we got on to the tour four days into the tour we had no merch the fourth day it did turn up the boxes the image of the corruption of mercy 
um, it was nearly all white. It had been so drenched and saturated in white, you could not see it. And uh. we're standing there going, why would anyone send this out? Why, did, why didn't the printing company call me and go, look, we've done a test print and there's something wrong, blah, 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 didn't get that call. It, all this type of stuff. So people lie to you. People butter you up and they, they drop you from the greatest height. So again, the, the, to, to end that, you know, watch your back. Don't believe everybody when they say they're going to help you and they support you and this and that, because unless they see money signs in their eyes, they, they don't want to help you. And unless it can benefit them and their agenda, they don't want to help. They'll say they'll help. And that's what I've discovered for so, well, actually, you know, until you guys came along, you've given me faith. And I mean that. Oh. I, can't even tell you, but, but, but seriously, I know everything costs money, but sometimes when people say they're going to do something, they could at least follow through on that or just not say it at all or not promise it at all. <clears throat> uh, I just, I don't know what the scene's like too much now because I'm not overly involved in it, but I'd like to think it's not changed that much. You know, people will tell you what you want to hear. They'll get your hopes up and they will destroy them. But now and then, some people do come along who, who do genuinely want to see you succeed and help you. And I'll tell you, apart from like some of the people that I've mentioned who have given me advice or my friend Matthias, the one who used to be in hypocrisy, he bought me um, a piece of equipment because he knew I couldn't afford to do it. And it was just, he just said, right, in a few days, you've got something arriving. And I was like, wow, I was so touched. The amount of people that bent over backwards for me in this whole journey of torn between two worlds, it, I've not got comfortable again, because I know that can be ripped out from underneath me at any moment. Hence, another reason why we don't really think we want to be signed because the biggest slap in the face also is when you're told you can't upload your music online because you don't own it. We don't <laughs> want to go through that. But as I said, Lindsay came to me. She had contacted me a few times in her career with Cradle of Filth, and she knows how I felt. I, I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, I didn't want that in my life. I didn't want people knowing what I was doing. So I I did tell Lindsay I kept her at arm's length and it wasn't anything personal to her it's just what she was associated with but Lindsay woke me up she really really did and obviously you guys are a, a continuation of her helping me and you know when you guys came to me and said you know you want to help it was like well there's got to be a catch they either want to sleep with me or they want one of my body parts. Well, I, I mean, but, want your body. Right? I mean, come on. But no one gives without wanting something back. Obviously, the things that people do for me, I never forget when people put themselves out because eventually I will repay that. And that's how I always feel like I do definitely owe them something back. But, um, yeah, people have been really, really good to us. They've been really good to me. Um, the response I've had, and it all boils down to the kindness and generosity of genuine people. And I think if I'd have had those genuine people 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't have walked away, you know? Oh. So shame on you guys for taking 10 years to come into my life. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Sarah. I'm sorry. <laughs> But, I would have done it sooner. Yeah. But, Holly, but, you know, Holly was like a baby when this happened when, <laughs> 10 years ago. You, how dare you, Holly, be a baby? But in all seriousness, we I, I appreciate that so much. And I'm, I'm sure these other guys do too as well. Um, I'm, I'm not crying. You, you I'm guys not are crying. crying. Are you okay? I, I, just, I just have something in both my eyes. Yeah, oh, nothing. 
But uh, so Sarah, we're gonna have to wrap up pretty quick because we're already at the one hour and five minute mark. This has been an awesome podcast. So, is there anything else you wanna you wanna say before we uh, end off this uh, amazing podcast? Keep supporting us. Thank you for listening to us. If you don't like us, okay. If you do like us, that's fantastic, and just support us. <coughs> support everyone. You know, it's been a crap year and a half. You know, uh, we don't need any more misery. And let's all just support each other and give each other hugs. Actually, no, skip the hugs because of COVID. (laughs) Elbow, touch elbows or something. But no, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, for supporting us and doing what you've done because, uh, wow, to, to have people like you no matter how long your kindness lasts for, won't ever forget this, what you've done for us. Honestly, um, thank you. Everyone, everyone needs you guys. You know, the place would be, the, the music scene would be a much better place if there was more people like you. And I mean that. You're going to make us melt, melt, Sarah. We're going to like turn into a puddle of goo at the end of this. But it's true. It's absolutely true. If there was more people like you, the scene would be a much nicer place. Well, we so, do appreciate But thank you. On that note, does anybody else have any follow-up questions for Sarah before I end off? No, Are not we... right now. I'm, I'm going to just go <laughs> cry in my corner. Yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, par- party on Corey, party on Holly. Party on Curtis, party on Sarah. Party on everybody. <laughs> <laughs>